Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman, a retired family doctor and a CLL patient myself and the co-founder, executive vice president, chief medical officer of the nonprofit CLL Society here at ASH 2022 in New Orleans. Dr. Thompson? Yeah, I'm, I'm Dr. Philip Thompson. I'm uh, um, uh, one of the physicians in the CLL group at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So Dr. Thompson, you had an oral presentation and it was in this theme that seems to be the main theme at ASH this year for the CLL section, which is combination therapies, doublets and triplets. And it seems that that's a direction that a lot of the research is going in. And I'm gonna read the name of the paper and then I'm gonna ask you to explain why you did that research, why it's important, what questions you were looking to answer with this questions that other doublets and triplets weren't looking at. So it was, Venetoclax consolidation achieves durable off-treatment remissions in patients with high-risk CLL who've been on ibrutinib for more than a year. So explain, there's some things here that you're gonna have to explain to patients, like what is consolidation, what were you trying to do? So walk us through the design of this trial and why you wanted to do this trial. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so, I mean, the first thing to say is that, that really patients that are on a, a bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor like ibrutinib or acalabrutinib um, for, for CLL, um, th the default position is to continue these drugs indefinitely until either the patient has side effects that mean they can't take it anymore or the disease uh, relapses during during therapy, you know, becoming resistant to the to the treatment, um, and we know that there are certain things that make resistance more more likely. Um, uh, the most important of them probably being a deletion on chromosome 17p, um, but also things like complex chromosome abnormalities, which we call a, a complex uh, carrier type. So. You know, the, the aim of this study really was to add a second drug, venetoclax, um, which is able to get very deep remissions for patients, meaning um, down to the level of what we call undetectable MRD, meaning we can't, using the technology that we have, measure any CLL um, on the treatment. And we think this is more or less a pre prerequisite to be able to stop therapy and then have a prolonged time off therapy. And I think this is a desirable approach for two reasons. Firstly, um, we can, um, if we are able to get patients into a deep remission and stop therapy, we reduce the likelihood that, that the um, disease will become resistant to a treatment and will lose the ability to use that drug. And secondly, we spare patients the, side, the ongoing side effects of the, of the therapy and spare the patients or their payer the cost, the cost. of those medications. Yeah. I mean, cost is a huge issue, as, 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 you, as you know, in, in healthcare in, in, in general. And I do think this approach actually could be significantly more cost effective than the current paradigm of treat until, uh, until relapse um, and then treat with a second drug. So explain the concept, which is borrowed, I think, from um, other cancers of mm -hmm. consolidation. So mm. what does that mean when you're an oncologist or a hematologist? Yeah, so, so um, you know, it, because things evolve during, during, you know, as we learn more about drugs and we learn about why they, they work and stop working, um, you know, the treatment paradigms evolve. So, you know, initially we, we used ibrutinib um, uh, as a single, single agent. Then we had venetoclax, which we used in people who had become resistant to ibrutinib. And then, uh, and then people said, well, you know, let's, let's use the two of them together. You know, they complement each other in the way that right. they work. Um, each of them makes the other one work better, which we call synergy. Um, and so a lot of studies started to be done where patients who had not yet received either of those two drugs were treated with those two drugs together. Um, but what I was interested in doing is to say, well, okay, um, patients who are already on ibrutinib are excluded from those those trials. So let's design a, a, a study where we add on the venetoclax as a as a consolidation to try and get rid of detectable uh, CLL in in those patients that we know are at higher risk of of developing resistance. And so, tell me a little bit more about the trial design. How long did somebody have mm -hmm. to be on ibrutinib, and where did they have to be at in that yep. pathway? Yeah, so, so patients had to have received at least one year of ibrutinib therapy. Um, they had to have, still have detectable CLL, which, which, which is virtually all patients on Right, on because it's very rare for people to get 
to undetectable, measurable residual it, it, disease exactly. and CLL. It, it actually happens with, with, with occasionally, but, but it does happen. But really rarely, yeah. yeah. Um, and they ha so they had to have detectable disease. They couldn't have uh, what we, we term disease progression. So they had to still be responding to the ibrutinib. Um, and then they had to have one or more of what we call high risk features, which at the time we designed the study, um, that was uh, a deletion on chromosome 11Q, uh, 17P, a complex uh, uh, chromosome rearrangements or a mutation in the TP53 gene. Um, and uh, so then we, uh, then we just continue. Let me just sorry, stop you yeah, there. Yeah. But right now, you'd probably leave the 11Q out. Correct. Of that exactly. Because e exactly. We know That's that those patients respond really well to ibrutinib. Yeah. So at the time, we were looking at data from um, the original phase one study of right. the, uh, of, of, of ibrutinib, where 11Q did appear to be a high risk feature, um, and in more recent data sets, that that is really not the case. So. Um, as it happens, uh, the, you know, if I was designing it today, I would not have included those those patients. But I, th I think those patients still benefit enormously from okay. being on the on the therapy. So, how many patients did you get into the trial? And, yep. uh, and tell us a little bit about how safe this approach was. Yeah. So, so we uh, treated forty five patients that were all on ibrutinib for more than a year. Um, and and just be, I'm sorry to keep interrupting. You. How long was the venetoclax when you added it in? Oh, sorry. Yeah, good, good, yeah. good question. So, so we we actually is actually a what we call a response adapted uh, um, uh, uh, treatment duration. So, um, we treated patients for a maximum of 24, 28 day cycles. So more or less two years. Um, then if they still had detectable disease at the end of, of two years, we continued the abrutinib as a maintenance. Okay. If they had undetectable disease at the end of two years, we, we stopped, uh, we, well actually patients had the choice to either continue abrutinib maintenance or stop abrutinib. And the majority stopped abrutinib in that, in that situation. But we also allowed early treatment cessation in patients who, who rapidly responded. So if someone had a complete remission with undetectable MRD, on two consecutive assessments, six months apart, they they could stop um, uh, drugs earlier than 24 cycles. So that was five patients at cycle 12 and five patients at cycle 18. Okay. Uh, the remainder of the patients continued on to, to cycle 24. So how many patients in total did you treat and yep. what were some of the side effects? Mm -hmm. These are two very potent mm -hmm. drugs you're putting together yep. and we're living in a time of infections and risks. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. 45 in total. Um, uh, so the the major side effect that patients complained of is diarrhea. Um, so that's pretty much seen universally across um, BTK venetoclax combination. It's really the the main kind of overlapping toxicity of those two two drugs. Um, I will the say the main toxicity that both drugs have. Therefore, when you put exactly. it together, it gets worse. It gets yeah. worse exactly. Yeah. So, so, so the the diarrhea with ibrutinib venetoclax, sorry, calibrutinib venetoclax, it, are, are worse than with either drug alone. Uh, that being said, although more than half patients on the study reported diarrhea, it was always of, um, it was almost always of grade one or grade two severity. So milder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Grade, grade one or two severity can essentially be managed with um, symptomatic um, treatment such as Imodium to, 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 to treat the diarrhea. Um, the, the most uh, common, uh, what, what we call high grade adverse event was neutropenia. So a lowering of the neutrophil count, which of course is important for um, uh, fighting bacterial uh, in infections. Um, uh, we saw 20% of patients have uh, uh, grade three or higher neutropenia, um, which is actually lower than some of the other ibrutinib venetoclax studies. Uh, and that may have been because patients had been on ibrutinib for a long time before they started this, this trial. Um, and most importantly, we saw no febrile neutropenia. So we didn't see anyone with neutropenia who uh, had to go to hospital because of, of, of a fever. Because um, a fever would mean an infection, which can exactly. be life-threatening if you don't have the neutrophils to fight it off. And this is something I always talk to the patients about. I say, okay, you know, people are going to get worried about neutropenia, but actually the risk of infection with venetoclax-induced neutropenia is very low in comparison to chemotherapy-induced neutropenia. 
And that's actually because chemotherapy damages the integrity of uh, the lining of your mouth and the lining of your gastrointestinal tract, wi um, which allows bacterial to, uh, bacteria to get into the, into the bloodstream. And that does not occur with venetoclax. Um, so so the, the infection risk was low. We, we saw three patients that needed hospitalization for an infection out of the 45 patients. And one had pneumonia, which we, we see commonly in CLL. One actually had a skin abscess. And one, one lady had a, um, a, a kidney in, infection, which, which we, we didn't really think was related in any way to the therapy. Okay, and COVID? Um, we did have some cases of COVID um, on, on, on the study, but thankfully no severe COVID. Okay, so and any other toxicities or other concerns? Um, so the other thing that I, 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 I mentioned is we saw zero tumor lysis syndrome. Okay. So tumor lysis syndrome, as, as you know, is, a, um, a, is something that, that occurred early in the development of venetoclax, where the potency of the drug results in rapid killing of CLL cells um, that can cause major biochemical derangements in, in, in the blood. Um, and uh, that's the reason that venetoclax has to be very gradually introduced with um, weekly escalation of the doses. Um, we saw none, none of that in this study. And we know ibrutinib is associated with some cardiac issues, mm -hmm. atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. hypertension, mm -hmm. but I've heard from other studies that adding the venetoclax does not make that worse in any way. Was that also your experience? Um, well, it's hard to t tell for sure without a control arm. Right. Um, uh, so, um, but I, I can say that we did have s a number of patients with cardiac issues that emerged during during the trial. Um, so we um, we actually had to stop ibrutinib in five of the forty five patients. Um, which is not kind of too dissimilar to what you would expect with ibrutinib mon uh, you know, as a single agent. Um, three of the patients, it was because of atrial fibrillation. Uh, one patient actually had non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, which is a potentially dangerous arrhythmia. Right. Um, and one patient uh, um, uh, had, had what we call sync unexplained syncope. Um, where, where he suddenly lost consciousness. Right, no so one, he's like fainting, yeah. Yeah, like fainted, he fainted, yeah. And he actually um, resulted in a, in a, a small um, uh, uh, hemorrhage um, on the uh, uh, in, uh, outside of the meninges in the, in the, in the, in the brain, which mm -hmm. thankfully didn't need any, any major interventions, but the we lining, had to stop Outside the, the lining of the brain. Outside yeah. the lining of the brain, yeah. So, yeah. so bleeding is one complication of, of a brutinib therapy. Um, uh, and um, uh, that was an example of, of when you know uh, someone had a, had a fall and, and you know um, but thank thankfully the patient recovered but we had to stop the ibrutinib. So tell me the results because that that's what I, I mean. This yeah. is it sounds like the toxicities were manageable, yeah. not surprising. Uh, but you know we're adding one powerful drug to another powerful drug. I'd expect that we'd get some pretty good response rates and tell us a little bit about that and the dur what you can about the durability of those responses. Yeah, so I was actually really pleased with the response rates that we saw. So, so um, we actually saw 71% of patients uh, uh, um, at the end of the study achieve undetectable MRD in the bone marrow. Um, Which is harder than finding it in the blood. In the, yeah. uh, I mean, yeah, uh, there's actually, with ibrutinib and venetoclax, there's actually quite a good correlation between uh -huh. blood and, and marrow. And, and, and again, I think maybe if I designed the study again, I might not have done so many bone marrows on, on patients. But um, uh, at the time, we didn't really ha have that, that information when we designed it. But um, the, the um, yeah, very high um, rate of undetectable MRD, particularly given that 63% of the patients on the study had a, a TP53 uh, abnormality. Um, which is the highest risk feature in, in, in CLL. Um, uh, in addition to the rates of undetectable MRD, um, we found 56% of the patients improved their response to a complete remission from, from a partial remission. Uh, and the average reduction in the size of lymph nodes uh, was 70%. So, wow. so even though these patients had been on ibrutinib for a long time, which is known to dramatically shrink lymph nodes, there was a further fairly significant benefit from the addition of venetoclax in terms of the reduction in the amount of the disease in the lymph nodes. So it wasn't just that it was clearing the bone marrow, it, 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 it was also very active in, in lymph nodes. Which is interesting to me because you might look at that patient and say, well, they're okay now, but the loads continue to shrink even mm -hmm. after that. Yeah. 
there, yeah. and we don't think of venetoclax as having the activity in the nodes. We think more in the blood and the marrow, and ibrutinib being more of the nodal. Uh, very interesting. Um, any conclusions or final thoughts on this? Wh how does this fit into the future? Where, d where do you see this going? I did, I, I did oh, want to mention the durability. Um, oh, yeah, uh, I yeah, yeah, so, 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 um, uh, so far we've only had five of the 45 patients develop disease progression. Only one of them during the combination of ibrutinib venetoclax, and this was actually a patient that, that um, probably had emergence of ibrutinib resistance at very low level before, before starting the therapy because we actually found a BTK mutation in his, in his baseline sample. Um, uh, but then only four patients, uh, um, so four patients subsequent uh, to stopping venetoclax developed disease progression, um, three of them while taking ibrutinib maintenance, and um, one of them actually developed a Richter transformation uh, after stopping both, both drugs. Um, thankfully, everybody responded to their subsequent salvage therapy. Um, but um, the, the, we've, in addition to the, the what we call progression-free survival, which is like how long did patients mm -hmm. stay in remission, we, we were also looking at the minimal residual disease every six months in, in the blood. Um, and that kind of gives us an early look at, at what might be going to happen in, in, in the future. You know, we can detect MRD in the blood, uh, you know, on average up to two years before you can actually detect it by examining the patient or looking at a routine um, CBC. Um, so um, we, we've found that, that and, we, and this is where we, we have a relatively short duration of follow-up for those results. It's 13 months on, on average, but we do have patients out beyond two, two and a half years. Um, and so far, 20, uh, uh, 21 of the 32 patients that have un un had undetectable MRD at the, end of, uh, at the end of therapy remain with undetectable MRD. Um, at, at, that, at that time point. And we haven't found any predictors of who's going to stay in remission longer, um, which in some ways is, is, is good because it means you've got such a potent therapy that it's able to kind of overcome a lot of negative prognostic right. in, in, indicators. So two out of three patients stayed undetectable. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So far. Yeah. yeah. Any uh, thoughts about where this might be going and things that you'd want to share mm. with the patient community about this research? There's a really active debate um, in, in, uh, in, the, in the field about what is the optimal way to use all of these fantastic drugs that we have now. You know, there are debates about should you be using a BTK inhibitor with venetoclax? Should be, you, you be using a BTK inhibitor alone? Should you be using venetoclax with obinutuzumab, which is an antibody? Or should you be using all three of those drugs together? Um, and I think we're going to need to wait uh, for some results from um, some of the really big randomized studies that are being done to, to try and answer some of these questions. Um, my personal uh, um, uh, view is I always like combination therapy rather than single uh, drug therapy um, in patients with high risk disease, um, uh, if it's accessible um, uh, um, according to you know, the, the reimbursement rules. Dr. Thompson, this is very interesting and uh, like I say, really kind of the theme of uh, what's been going on here today and over the last few days at ASH. Uh, thank you so much for the research that you're doing and I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks.